Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for our second um, Rate Review Advisory Group meeting of the year. Um, so thank you for your understanding and flexibility about the um, shift of the meeting date to today. Uh, this, was, this additional time was really helpful um, in our review of the rate review priority survey that we sent out um, in relation to our commitment to the work of the group. So can we go to the next slide, please? So on today's agenda, we'll start with approval of the January meeting minutes, um, then a brief update on the general ledger data collection process from Hilltop. Um, then we'll share the feedback we received from the rate review priority survey um, and more details around um, NDH's approach for this rate review cycle. Um, and finally, we'll have an open discussion before closing with next steps. And we'll, we'll talk about what you can expect from the March 16th meeting. Can we go to the next slide, please? All right. Um, as a reminder, the advisory group is part of the structure implemented to further MDH's commitment to the development of adequate and sustainable rates that promote the vision and mission of the DDA. Now, the commitment members have made to participate ensures an open and transparent process to review rates. Next slide, please. So our RAG members were sent an email with the meeting minutes on February 2nd. Um, as co-chair, I would like to make a motion to approve the minutes. Would a member like to second? Second. Karen Lee. Thank you. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Then we have approved the minutes. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And with that, I will turn it over to Kristen from Hilltop for our demo ledger, ledger data collection update. Good morning, everyone. Um, some quick updates. Um, the Hilltop Institute continues to review the feedback submitted via the Qualtrics survey by five providers who participated in the work group. Um, again, the feedback questions were targeted um, at the instructions, cost category definitions, ability to provide requested data, potential accounting system updates, and the time needed to complete the data, um, pulling it together, and then as well as completing the template. It also allowed um, the individuals to share additional comments, um, suggestions, um, and feedback. Additionally, we are reviewing the seven submitted templates for comments shared directly in submissions um, as there was um, edits and recommendations included in those submissions. Um, Hilltop has engaged with Optimus on feedback related to how the data is being collected and discussing the possibility of suggesting alternatives based on the provider feedback. Many of the suggestions and feedback are related to the granular level of the data requested. Um, the template currently requests providers to allocate costs across the seven designated cost categories by service, so very detailed. Additionally, Hilltop is gathering feedback and questions that relate to policy issues and questions to share with the DDA. Some of these key topics, as we discussed last week or last month, include um, interest, appreciation, and requirements for general ledger templates to be matched um, to audited financials. We are working to make final edits to the general ledger template um, and will be completed in the coming weeks and target to share an updated version um, with the RAG in March. This is Chris, I have a quick question for you. Can you elaborate, uh, can you go back one slide for me, please, if you don't mind? 
when we say engaged conversations with optimists related to the granularity of the data collection needed to inform the rate setting process, can you kind of elaborate on what that process looks like? I mean, obviously, Hilltop's knee deep in the uh, the geo collection data, and and obviously, as a member of the RAG, looking for that information direct. Is it being vetted by optimists? Is it going through optimists for presentation? Can you elaborate on what that what that point means? Sure. Um, one of the key topics that came up as part of the discussions with the pilot work group was related to being able to provide the level of detail needed for some of the add-on services or the one-to-one -one or two-to-one services. And so really talking with Optimus about you know, whether those services can be included um, in what providers were calling the base service. And so rolling all the costs up together um, as opposed to providing the costs separately um, and what kind of data Optimus you know, ideally would need to set rates separately um, for those add-on services that have their own rates in the system. I mean, will we be able to take a look at that part of the process too? I mean, I think it's key that, you know, we maybe have some input as to how it gets collected and and the format in which it gets, you know, reviewed. I mean, obviously the pieces of the puzzle um, for every provider are different, how they pull them, how they get the data. We can give them target A, target B, target C, how as, as one provider, how I get to A, B, and C may be different than the other ones. I think just it's important for us to understand I guess that level of the process between the collection piece and, and then what's actually going to be presented. Yeah, so I mean, the goal is definitely to share the updated template with the RRAG. Um, it will look, you know, vastly similar to the draft that we shared in the fall. Um, right now, we're really just working on those specific nuances related to the, the guidance and where the cost, you know, should be allocated across the categories. And making you know just some minor tweaks to the the template and formatting itself based on feedback, um, but we can certainly share you know that feedback that was provided and the changes that we made to the template based on the feedback and discussions, um, you know, including our you know optimist as a subject matter expert for what they'll need in terms of the data. Okay, so gotcha. this is Karen Adams Gilchrist, and my CFO was um, was involved in the work group, and I know there was a significant amount of feedback relative to the data collection and the inability to i guess drop data into all of the different buckets and so the report the, the template that we submitted back it put it all together because we don't collect that's not the way we collect data so she has a really a big concern about are we going to be able to work that piece out because if we're just going to collect if you're saying just dump it all into one bucket does it does it really tell you what you're going to need to know, or are we just going to continue to base it on assumptions? Because it's kind of like the old cost report, it's a lot of assumptions being made. Um, and then some other pieces that I'm sure she shared with she shared with the group, but um, just trying to figure out how to pull out transportation from small group, large group, large group, one on one, virtual. We we don't collect data that way, and people don't come in for services um, based on what service they're getting. They come in just for services. They don't come in based on small group or large group and trying to figure those pieces out. Um, so she was really concerned about the use of the buckets, buckets and the inability to pull data that way. And, you know, I, I can only speak for our, our agency. And we don't necessarily have the sophistication to pull it the way that the, the template is asking for it. So I don't, I, it's just concerned that how meaningful is it really gonna be if we can't pull it. Right, and thank you, Karen. That is really helpful um, feedback and definitely part of the discussions that we've been having, um, you know, with the information, um, you know, similar to what you're saying, other providers shared as well. So some of the discussions with Optimus is, you know, how can we manage and leverage the data that the providers are able to provide, you know, at the most granular level to help inform the process, you know, moving towards a very data-driven, you know, data, collection as opposed to, um, you know, any, you know, estimates or projections um, and, you know, really making it data driven. Um, so I think the goal will be to, to share the template back, you know, talk about the, the vision and the goal for the, the future of data collection and then work with providers, um, you know, to, to get as, you know, much data at the granular level needed, you know, to inform the methodology that's been selected. You know, those cost categories really do inform the brick. 
Is the updated template going back to the work group or is the work group done? Um, the work group is done. The next step will be to share it um, with this group um, for your you know, additional review um, and any final feedback. Thank you. Kristen, what, what is the, the goal for implementation on the new tool? I mean, are we looking at trying to catch FY24 data? Are we going to try and catch FY23 to see kind of what we've got? And the reason I bring that up is obviously we're, you know, February 24th. We'll see kind of the revision in March and kind of see what it looks like. But if we're going to implement to collect FY24, we've got to have this process at least wrapped up or close to being wrapped up to give prior providers the opportunity to address really the, the issue that Karen was just saying. Not everybody's collecting that data the same way. And if we're going to, ex if the expectation is going to be to collect the data in the format that we want, they need time to implement. Uh, and you don't want to implement, you know, as a former CFO, you don't want to try and implement mid-year uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to be recording transactions all year long. If I need to reclass something or record something in a different fashion to be able to present that information, I need to know before, well, well before July 1st starts. So I'm just kind of looking at that time frame. You know, I guess we could catch 23 if, if people are able to dump it in, but I think the uh, the data is going to be skewed a little bit because people aren't prepared to collect it. But then if we're going to ask them for 24, are we going to be able to commit to them that they can have this information, this setup, this structure before July 1st so they can prepare for it? Yeah, Chris, I appreciate you finding that timeline. Um, the goal really is um, to be able to have providers start collecting the data in the format starting with fiscal 24, um, you know, for all those reasons that you noted that collecting the historical data, you know, may be a little more challenging. Um, and so as we, you know, continue to, to have the discussions, you know, we're, we're hopeful to stick to that timeline, um, you know, and I can definitely defer to the, to the DBA for, you know, any additional guidance or um, thoughts they have. Uh, yeah. Sure. So, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Laura. Uh, no, go ahead, Robert. I'll, I'll go after you. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, we think that this uh, GL data collection tool is uh, a tool that we can uh, use in place of the cost reports um, that we were accustomed to in the uh, fee payment system. Uh, but Karen, I, I do think you you bring up a, a good point because we understand there there are uh, differences in how providers um, ass assign costs to different uh, cost categories, and not that I'm looking for an answer here, but I think uh, for folks who may be listening and or part of the committee, uh, it would be good to start thinking about, you know, how we can support you all in kind of developing uh, that capacity um, to, 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 to see how, you know, we can assist in, in and trying to make this, uh, you know, uh, I guess, help you present the data in a way that's going to be helpful in informing some of the decisions that we'll be making moving forward. Robert, were we able to get any feedback from the pilot group with respect to how prepared they felt they were to be able to translate their general ledger into the new format? I mean, did they give you a sense that Okay, we're we're halfway there. We're three quarters of the way there, or we're five percent of the way there. I mean, what what kind of a a turn do they have to take? Um, so of course I can give you some quick um, feedback that we got um, from the five providers who did um, submit, you know, through our survey. Um, and I will say, almost a majority of those providers um, who had submitted data and submitted feedback had said it would be a relatively small lift to get their systems in, you know, ready to be able to deliver the data this way. Um, but we are really mindful that that was a very small number and it was inclusive of the providers in the group who did submit data back to us. Gotcha, so it's a sample size of, of some active providers that are, you know, involved in the process already. So they're, they're paying attention to that versus some that may not be, uh, but, but maybe woefully unprepared for that piece of it. And just just let me add that we we were not able to submit ours um, in the bucket. We had to do an aggregate. We had to drop everything into the one bucket. So, you know, I'm you know I don't know if 
if my CFO said it would be an a, a easy lift. I'm not so sure about that, but she certainly knows more about it than I do. Uh, and I think, Karen, just kind of back what you're saying, I think ultimately the goal here is to make sure that we have consistent consistent data collection. Uh, you know, when we went back and we, we looked at the original pilot group that submitted GLs back in, I guess it was probably 16 or 17, um, just some clarity. I mean, the one piece that stuck out to me, still sticks out to me, is the overtime component. Uh, certain providers were putting it in the payroll and wage bucket. Others were putting it in the program bucket. You know, when it, when you put it in the payroll bucket, it gets overwritten by the BLS rate rate in in the calculation. So it's that consistency to make sure we don't have a flaw in how we're collecting it, uh, but also too that the providers are consistent in how they report it. Uh, and, and you know, we can put it wherever we want. We can figure out where it goes when we're done with it. But that consistency piece of it is key. Uh, and making sure we know where that data is or where that piece of the data is uh, within each of the providers' reports. And, and Chris, I think that was a um, big piece. I think maybe Kristen can can attest to that. That was a big piece of the feedback was that the data will be based on a lot of assumptions, which is concerning because all of us as providers will be making assumptions about how we submit the data. So as much as we can scale that back and get consistent data that's being submitted succinctly across the board would be extremely helpful, but. This is Donna, Donna I think to piggyback on that as well, um, if we're gonna try to have the process more uniform so we do have the consistent data, we just need the time to really educate the providers on how to do this. And I'm right. looking at, we're already at March. So if this is something we're seriously considering, for FY24, there's really a lot to be done um, to roll that out. Otherwise, we're going to end up with, you know, the inconsistencies with the data, as Karen alluded to. Again, um, I think the idea in getting everyone on the same track is perfect. It's just having enough time and uh, the avenues to educate the agencies on how to pull and dump that data. And I would have to reiterate Donna's point there. I mean, it, it's you're trying to turn the, as a provider, you're trying to turn the Titanic. How how we record things, and we can record however it needs to be recorded, but it's not consistent across providers, and it is definitely a it can be a heavy lift uh, from an infrastructure perspective. So I'll go back to my my stance that I've had for several years, which is at least 90 days notice prior to the start of that fiscal year. And I'm glad we're starting on a fiscal year. I think that's key. Uh, but that means from a time frame perspective, what comes out of here next month pretty much has to be as close to ready to go with instructions and guidance uh, so that providers can start to look at that. Not that we can't follow up between April and, and June 30th, but we can't come out mid-June. The providers will not have enough time. I mean, that's fiscal year end, already busy there. And then to having to turn around uh, maybe a general ledger reconstruct of some fashion in that time frame is going to be extremely difficult. So as much time as we can give them, I think still needs to be clo as close to 90 days as possible. I just wanted to jump in with two things. It's Laura. Um, one is, I don't know how much, you know, folks looking at the general ledger piece um, have this in mind, but, you know, um, providers not only have to restructure the general ledger, but they also have to be able to crosswalk expenses from the previous year to the next year for their 990. And so, you know, just to everybody's point, it's really going to take a lot of thinking for providers to make, you know, a restructure of a general ledger work. Um, so there's that. The, uh, the other thing I'd started to say earlier is just when we talk about the this being reviewed in March, I think if this group is asked to review, it really needs to be, um, you know, you know, if there's going to be a meaningful discussion, it probably needs to get to this group two weeks before the meeting um, because providers will want to talk to their CFOs, may want to talk to their auditors um, to to really give any meaningful feedback once we see it. I'm not as deep into the weeds as, as what 
you know, Karen and, and uh, Christian and Laura are on this, but the other thing that dawns on me is, does it matter at all where people are in the, in, in the uh, LTSS versus PCIS2 and people who are in two systems and, and all of that, is it, is the timing of this, does that matter at all either? Just, just wondering. Mm -hmm. um, so Karen, real quick to that point, the template is designed to be able to collect, you know, cost data across the two systems. And so okay. for, you know, services that may split the systems or for services that have transitioned, um, the template really is intended to collect the cost by, um, you know, payment mechanism. Um, and then to, to everyone else's comments, you know, we certainly appreciate um, and understand, you know, all the time and energy that it will take to make the transition to being able to collect data in this way. Um, and so one of the big goals of utilizing the um, pilot work group was to really have the opportunity to talk with providers who had the opportunity to really look. They pulled in their CFOs. We had discussions about um, many of the topics that you guys have, have flagged here for us on um, you know, the overtime and wages and where's the best cost category and you know, taking feedback from them and then you know, vetting it with optimists about you know, where they're putting things and how that impacts the brick and you know, the different pieces of that. So we're hopeful that as we, you know, roll out this, you know, finalized draft version to you, that many of these concerns are already addressed, um, and that we can come up with a solid plan to to roll this out to the larger provider community and provide that support that's needed um, to get it implemented by fiscal 24. Um, and so we will certainly work to get this out to you as quickly as possible, um, so we can have that really meaningful conversation in March um, and keep moving forward. Thank you everyone for all that feedback. Um, I think we're going to take a lot of that back and discuss it further in the coming days because it really is um, useful to hear this perspective. Um, this one, why don't we transition um, over to talking about our FY25 rate review priorities um, that has been informed uh, by the feedback received um, from the survey that we sent um, to the RREG members last month. Can we go to the next slide, please? All right. um, first of all, thank you to the seven members who participated in the rate priority survey. Um, it's important to note that the our egg member priority ranking is reflective only of those survey responses that provided rank ordering, which was three of the seven responses. Um, every respondent, however, provided valuable feedback that has directly uh, supported MDH's decision making around the FY25 rate priorities. Um, to summarize the ranking, um, the career path development for DSP was ranked as the highest priority. Um, rate sufficiency for non-billable staff time and exploring the relationship between wages and staff turnover um, were tied for second. Um, we had a three-way tie for third priority, um, comparing assumptions to waiver policy and renewal, employment services rate development, um, and transportation component equity. Um, the majority of respondents indicated the importance of looking at these priorities holistically. Um, for example, a member noted that all these priorities are interrelated with each other. Um, and then another member noted that some of the issues are macro and some are micro, and that separating them indicates that they are separate problems. Does anyone have any questions about these results um, before we continue to talk about MDH's um, thoughts on how we want to action the priorities? All right. I will then turn it over to Robert. Thank you, Jennifer, um, and good morning, everyone. So uh, first, I want to acknowledge that we continue to have a shared goal <clears throat> around evaluating the adequacy of meaningful day rates, um, as well as prioritizing uh, workforce stability. Uh, so using your contributions and feedback and in agreement with your comments, 
about the interrelation of the priority list. The department has worked to develop a plan to advance work across these two key focus areas, um, addressing workforce and meaningful day services. So first to address our shared commitment to the workforce, we're going to leverage the current and ongoing work of the Maryland DSP Consortium. This will help shape the next steps, including the need or recommendation for expanding, for expanded sampling uh, that will lead to the development of formal recommendations. And then, you know, these recommendations will ultimately be shared uh, with the RAG. In the area of meaningful day services, the department is going to focus on day have and employment. So for day have, this will be action through the RAG while the study of employment services will be actioned through the Employment First Committee. Um, Nick Burton met with the Employment First Provider Subcommittee on February 13th. The subcommittee discussed various survey questions uh, for DDA providers related to meaningful day services and LTSS. Uh, and he should have draft survey questions to the subcommittee members by uh, this coming Monday, February 27th, to review and provide feedback. Once survey questions are finalized, the survey will be sent out by a constant contact. The subcommittee will review survey responses and as applicable, make rate recommendations to the RAG. The goal is to have recommendations from the committee shared with the RAG in the early spring. Um, and due to what we have heard from you all about DAHAB rates specifically, we will be conducting a comprehensive review of provider cost data to evaluate the key rate components. Uh, we've worked with Optimus to develop an approach that will accelerate this uh, a very important review and best guide us forward. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris to kind of, you know, take a deeper dive into what that means. Well, thanks, Robert. Um, so, yeah, DDA has provided that direction uh, to focus on the day habilitation services, and they've tasked us with supporting the process to review those rates. So, um, just to kind of give some context there, there's nine component values uh, that are used to calculate the rates for the services. Um, in, the, in addition to those values, there are some methodological and calculation assumptions that are implied in how they're combined to develop the rates. So we've had some discussions with DDA about how and when uh, those values, the methodology calculations might be best reviewed. So um, we want to make sure that we're keeping, you know, in line with the timetable we had shared last month. Uh, so we're, the plan is to review kind of the planned process now and ask you to reflect on what we propose. And then in March, uh, we'll share more of those data request templates that are informed by any feedback that you can provide now or in between now and the next meeting. And then um, as soon as possible after that meeting, begin to collect data uh, through some identified provider sampling. In April, we'll share the preliminary results from the data collected and ask for um, you know, the review from the RAG. Uh, in May, we will share the preliminary recommendations for fiscal year 25 rate updates that are informed by that feedback and again ask for your review and then in june share that final those final recommendations that are informed by your additional feedback uh, for dda to consider um, you know any budget impacts and funding levels based on those proposals um, and in july dda would meet with the budget teams from dbm or mdh to talk about the proposed changes and make that final determination about any funding level changes. So we talked about there's nine component values. Um, the plan is to review the base wage assumption, uh, the facility component, the program support component, the training component, and the service adjustment, which is really kind of also, uh, also known as closures. Um, those components in this cycle. So we have a process proposed to review each of these and we'd like to hear any feedback on the process, um, like how the data can be collected and used, uh, what context should be considered in that, and any alternative sources of information. So we'll just start with that first one for the base wage assumption. Uh, we plan to review emerging uh, BLS data, which is the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, and potentially any other recent wage data sources. 
um, share those results and how they compare to the current assumptions with the RAG and ask the RAG for input on how best to interpret and use these data to support the base wage assumption. Uh, next for the facility and program support components, uh, this would kind of be like a subset of what had been done in the past. We plan to collect a small version of the general ledger data um, from the relevant providers. So that would essentially ask for facility, program support, and wage expenses to compare the facility and program support assumptions uh, to the current model. Uh, next would be the training component. We plan to review and discuss the methodology and assumptions currently in place in the model. Um, which is based on, um, you know, some hours uh, provided by DDA on, you know, appropriate training for various positions and some um, assumptions around full-time and part-time staff and turnover rates. Uh, so we share all that with the RAG and look uh, for feedback from the RAG on how that uh, could potentially be changed. And then the final one there is that service adjustment or that closures component. Uh, so we plan to share the assumptions with the RAG around how that value was, uh, you know, determined. Um, solicit input on what data can be collected and what would best represent that information, and then request the data from providers and summarize it for comparison with the current model. So um, that's the first first piece. There is looking at some of those components. Uh, again, you know, we're we're looking to follow DDA's direction and just kind of talk through how the process will work for reviewing that. Um, so based on that, those component review plans, I'll just open it up for a minute here, see if there's any initial thoughts around the process for collecting and reviewing that data. Um, with the, you know, expectation that, you know, this is all new information, so anything you can share at the moment would be helpful. Uh, also, anything you can share after the meeting in between um, and up till the next meeting would also be helpful. I would just ask if you were going going to integrate the uh, two top priorities here, the meaningful day service and the workforce career pathway development um, and the data that's already been collected specifically in the workforce. We've been collecting data with the Department of Labor for about 15 years. So we're in pretty good shape to be able to already give you um, validated data on career pathways and and workforce and will that be considered in the component review yeah i think that that would be very helpful um so you know traditionally we had looked at uh, dls data and if that's you know data that you you're describing that's available you know based uh, already uh, created based on your work for the last 15 years i think that's that would be exactly the kind of thing that we'd be looking at. So, you know, we would probably still look at the BLS data to have some comparisons and we can talk about how that information would be used. Um, but absolutely, any experience that you have, any data um, from the state and recent information would absolutely be helpful there. Yep, we have it to, to share with you. Um, Chris, it's Laura. Um, I think um, similar to Karen's point, um, because I think there are, you know, like obviously career pathway is going to cut across more than meaningful day. Um, the other um, potential factor I think that needs to be considered is um, the minimum wage. Um, trajectory that's happening in Maryland. Um, it's hard to know what we won't know until uh, probably mid-April what ultimately happens and, and that could change in future years. But, you know, right now they are, the governor has as a priority to um, put a CPI escalator on the minimum wage um, moving forward starting in FY25. So um, in addition to accelerating um, the minimum wage to $15 an hour uh, in the, you know, in the coming year. So anyway, I just, I think that needs to be a piece along with BLS. So, Cause you know, the issue with BLS is you're always looking back. And I think, you know, we need to also include if we know something is coming, looking forward and then obviously the career pathway piece. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I really appreciate that feedback. Um, and in the model, we do have, you know, a BLS information, like you said, is in the past and a, um, a piece there of how to adjust it uh, for um, projected time periods. But I think that's exactly the kind of feedback and information that we're looking for support 
on how to interpret this information. So, you know, if we come back with something that uh, looks like it would be incongruous with uh, any minimum wage expectations, that's something that we would really need to have that discussion and consider about what assumptions we need to make there, how we should best interpret that data. So absolutely, that's that's uh, really helpful. Um, and as we start, you know, collecting that data and sharing those kind of interpretations and projections with you, uh, that's where we'd be looking for that additional feedback. So thanks. Well, we would love Another. to get you the data before you actually do projections. We would like to inform your projections through the use of the data. Yes, yeah, absolutely. That that would be the intent there. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm speaking over Robert there, but we would love to be able to touch base and collect that beforehand. Okay. Great. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. Uh, as soon as you can get that to us, Karen, uh, the better. Um, and also, Laura, to your point, we've been looking at the, you know, that BLS methodology, especially focusing on any BLS wage that falls below that $15 an hour threshold. Um, and we're, we're, we started to kind of look at that outside side of this process. So um, we hope to be able to give an update in one of the upcoming RAG meetings. In other yeah. states, we've included a uh, an adjuster within the direct care wage model that um, does a calculation and looks to see what the um, BLS is versus a minimum wage. And so we can incorporate um, that as part of the methodology here uh, if there are a minimum wage requirement. I think the other thing to say as part of this discussion is, you know, a lot of states are looking at having standards of um, between uh, 25 and 50 percent above the wage as a starting wage for direct support professionals um, in order to, you know, <laughs> make them uh, competitive and to deal with their workforce issues. So <clears throat> I would just say I think we need to look at more than where we are in relationship to minimum wage. I think we need to think about, you know, from policy perspective, what's an appropriate goal for those starting wages and um, go from there. This, this is Chris. Chris this uh, is oh, go ahead, Scott. Go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, Chris, kind of so. second. Go ahead, buddy. You got it. <laughs> uh, um, I'll jump in. Uh, Chris, high level question to you, Chris. The percentile uh, ranking uh, in, in the um, brick method, can you give me like a, a, a Two or three sentence explanation for for where you where that how that's figured and how it applies and what you would be looking at for that. Uh, sure. So if I'm understanding um, what you're asking in the model, essentially we have a wage and a percentile next to it, and the percentile um, that really was uh, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They provide a range of wages, and so they'll have. Um, you know, for whatever position, uh, whatever job title they have there, it'll say, you know, at the 10th percentile, it's this, at the 50th percentile, it's this, at the 90th percentile, it's this. Um, since the BLS has their own set of job codes that don't always match exactly to what any specific program is, um, there are some assumptions that have been made, um, you know, on DDA's part there around how the BLS data can be used to inform the wage assumptions there. So for example, if um, a DSP in a certain uh, position might be similar to the job code that existed in BLS, but probably more on the higher end, they may have picked a higher assumption there, like the 75th percentile of the data that's present. Does that help kind of answer that question? It does, Chris, and that was my interpretation. So I think we should, look at that and, and that, that may be part of your, your thing. That makes a big difference <laughs> on, on, on day half um, in particular. So I don't know whether that's part of your review was those assumptions in that where, where, where you pick the percentile. But that was my question. Thank you. Chris, it's Chris. Uh, a couple things. First of all, thank you to DDA for making it a commitment uh, or being committed to fixing the day rates. Uh, I mean, it's it's you know, rank, ranking the priority is very difficult. Obviously, all of them kind of impact day services, so appreciative of that. I think Laura's point to 
uh, a potential commitment at, at a percentage above minimum wage is really key to establishing some stability in the staffing and the workforce piece of it. Uh, you know, I started many years ago, we were probably 35 to 40 percent above minimum wage. I don't think we're anywhere near that now. Um, so that commitment, I think, would give us uh, a, a stable benchmark to move forward from. Uh, but then also, too, that the lessons as we go through this process of really kind of deep diving on day program and, and looking at what data we need to figure that part of it out. I hope that those lessons are going to be translated into that GL data collection tool. You know, what we need now is the same information that we're going to need moving forward, you know, whether it's two years from now, five years from now, or 10 years from now. And Chris, just to, the the high point that, that we were able to track from a data perspective was that at one point it was 60, the, the rate funded a wage 69% above the minimum wage. So we've lost a huge amount of ground. I'm guessing that was a really long time ago. Not as long as you would think, Chris. <laughs> I mean, it's probably early 2000. So I uh, just want to reiterate, I, I'm hearing a lot of good feedback. Um, and this is exactly, you know, the intent of the RAG is to get that uh, information and context for how we're using things. So as we move forward and we can start looking at what data are telling us, what uh, pieces are, you know, we can have those discussions about, you know, does this make sense given the minimum wage currently and the projections um, or what relationship it has to the minimum wage or, um, you know, any of those sorts of pieces if we're selecting an appropriate percentile from BLS data or whether it's more appropriate to use some of that uh, from the Workforce Department of Labor data. Um, that's exactly the kind of thing that we'll be looking at, you know, so we'll be sharing those numbers with you all and, and looking for context on how we should best interpret that. Chris, I would I, also, go ahead. Go ahead, Karen. I just, when you're done, I want to jump in. I, I would also say that the other piece to think about is, you know, so that we're not creating something that we have to change, but rather create it from the beginning is, as we look at the career pathways and look at the competencies, we're using the CMS competencies so that it, it is a standardized, you know, they are standardized competencies, but as we look at the CMS competencies and making sure that the BLS code that you're starting with um, matches the BLS competencies, including when you're looking at employment services, looking at workforce development rather than at, you know, in-home care or support care or some of the other ones. And, that when you're looking at CDS or, or community to make sure that you're looking at, you know, community, different types of therapeutic recreation or different, looking at different BLS codes possibly um, that match what DDA's uh, competency requirements are for those specific positions. And again, better to get it right from the beginning rather than have to go back and try to, to change it afterwards. Okay, yeah, I think that's some great feedback. Um, we do have a couple kind of methodological or assumption kind of calculation things that we'd also like to chat through. So I'll just uh, leave it open there for one more minute and see if there's any other uh, kind of initial feedback on those components and the process that we're talking through here. Uh, again, with the expectation that, you know, we're presenting this all, you know, kind of live right now. So there may be uh, some additional kind of time you, know, you might need to digest this and provide additional feedback. So any other feedback you can share between now and the next meeting would be very helpful. Um, and we'll you know, have some of that, uh, those explicit plans laid out in the next meeting there. Chris, I'm, I do want to make a comment about um, the employment rates. So um, I can do that now or I can wait until you go through the methodology piece if you want to keep that connected to this discussion. I just want to make sure I comment before we uh, finish. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think now is a great time. Okay. Um, I'm a little worried about um, kind of uh, sort of continuing what we've done, which is say employment rates will be looked at by employment first. And I know there are a couple people, Karen and Donna, who are both on the employment first group. Um, 
as well. And, uh, you know, that group is really a policy group. And I think to, uh, without any, you know, support from, you know, the different uh, actuarial and rate setting experts that are the part of this discussion, I am, I'm really worried about where that's going to go. I think it is fine for employment first to make policy recommendations to inform the RAG, but I don't, I really don't think that employment, the employment rate should just be kind of completely carved out and, and, you know, kind of pushed to employment first, because I don't think that group has the resources to really be able to, um, you know, to do this as effectively as the RAG. Right, Laura, that's that, that's correct. So um, as we've always said, you know, the rates are there to support the policy. So this is like that initial step. Um, and, and then that work uh, will be forwarded to us and uh, will eventually find its way in, in front of this group to discuss it from a rate perspective. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll try to keep it open in terms of, you know, comments and discussion here, but uh, just in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next piece there. So we talked about those component values um, and in the model, you know, essentially those are all numbers that are uh, thrown in there and the way they get combined, there's some calculations and methodology implied in the current rates uh, that can be considered for review in this cycle. So the first one um, is something that we had talked about briefly last year, um, but uh, hadn't kind of fully vetted here. So the distribution of costs between setting sizes. And so specifically, this was in relation to transportation for day habilitation services. Um, for context that is at a high level, uh, currently the transportation costs are distributed based um, on an employee. Uh, in September, we had a meeting there. We talked about the proposal to redistribute those same costs kind of on a budget neutral basis, um, instead to be based on the individuals receiving service. So the intent there would be to review and describe the difference between those approaches with the RAG, kind of like we did in September, and ask for additional input on how data reflecting those differences could best be collected from providers, um, or what data can be support, uh, support any decisions there. Um, and to collect and share those data summaries with the RAG and get input on how we can use that data to support a recommendation uh, for an approach to take. Um, the next one is, uh, there's assumptions implicitly about non-billable time, and we've heard feedback from the RAG that may be more helpful to adjust the model to pull these implicit assumptions out and instead add an explicit adjustment to account for the cost of non-billable time. And so the intent there would be to solicit input from the RAG on how data could best be collected to represent that, uh, collect any data we can from providers, share those summaries, with the RAG for review, again, for you know context and uh, what the data are telling us, um, and get that use that information to uh, support a recommendation around an approach to take. And then the final piece there would be uh, based on input from the RAG, the structure of day habilitation group sizes might need additional review. Uh, so the con context on this is that there's currently four setting sizes. There's two to one, one to one, a small group, which is two to five individuals per DSP, and a large group, uh, which is six to 10 individuals per DSP. So the intent there would be to solicit input from the RAG on if and how that structure might be changed. And then based on that input, look to uh, work with the RAG on the method to collect data to represent those differences and how that can be collected, uh, what it can tell us, and then uh, how we would summarize or, you know, summarize the information that we get for review by the RAG and um, looking to see how that data can support any recommendations around an approach there. So those three pieces, just kind of recapping, is that distribution of costs between setting sizes, um, the implicit assumptions versus explicit assumptions about non-billable time, and then um, input on uh, whether there's any structural changes that might be warranted to the dehabilitation rates. Um, so, based on those kind of methodological review plans, are there any initial thoughts around the process for collecting and reviewing any of the data there? Chris, it's Chris. I'll just add that wherever we end up, not an initial thought, but wherever we end up with that lear lesson learned, 
it's got to translate into that GL collection tool moving forward. I, I, I would just add, you know, as Laura said, the, the Employment First Group can add good perspective priorities and values as policy and then as the RREG looks at that at the data with the professionals, that um, there has to be some other kind of um, value leadership based guidance for the development of all services. And you know, in lieu of having a, a, a work group that works with every single separate uh, service that's out there, looking at DDA's strategic plan, looking at DDA's value statements, looking at the direction of the organization. I think you need to, just as, as you are with the uh, in, uh, issues around employment, and one of the things that we did talk about in, in the employment, I've been talking about to Nick a lot about is, are we incentivizing employment or is there another service we're incentivizing? And so I just, really want to caution you to ensure that the direction that DDA is trying to take services in right now has value statements to them and looking at incentives to do them um, that in, in lieu of having a work group for every single um, service that puts forward values to use the existing values and value work that DDA has done in creating rates to that, that they want to uh, promote. Thanks, Karen. This is Scott. Boy, Chris, that's a lot of work. <laughs> I'm just seeing a, a lot that needs to be done in a, in short period of time and if, and if we're going to solicit input from providers that's hard to really get um i don't, I don't so it's, it's really more of a comment that's that's a it's a big workload to get all that input on that and, and to look at all those different pieces i don't know if there's a way to um a way to put some of that out as, you know as, as drafts earlier you know what should what should we as providers be thinking about um as far as you know, that whether it's the different group sizes, you know, I really hadn't given that much thought is two to five, six, ten, you know, should I be talking to my day staff about, you know, other things that they have seen and in, 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 um, in service delivery that would recommend, you know, I, I have certainly have opinions on billable time and things like that. But uh, so I, I, I don't know, Chris, if there's any way that we can help you <laughs> um, pull, pull some of that information in, happy to do it. Yeah, I know. Sure, yeah, we, we, Go ahead. Sorry, Chris. Uh, during the first <clears throat> cycle, we, we did kind of look at the uh, group sizes and had several options that we put in front of the committee. Maybe logical first step is to get that back out there so you can get insight to some of what the initial thinking was based on the feedback at the time. Yeah, and I'll just add uh, to that. Um, I think that's you know a good insight there. The uh, intent here is to make sure that we are um, using the RAG to the most you know effective way we can. Uh, so we're really looking for any support there on um, you know your input on how that data can be collected or or what kind of things we can consider and use there uh, to try to make that an efficient process. Because yeah, absolutely, it is a lot to work on. Uh, the intent is to try to um, do kind of the best we can with the information that we have available, and, and try to get support there on what information can be collected and how that can be used, um, so that we're moving forward and making progress. Chris, this is Maria. Um, in the past, last year we had the um, the fiat tool, the the provider um, uh, tool that was used to assess the adequacy of the rates, and that's where it highlighted um, many of the challenges of the meaningful day rates. Is there 
as part of this process, um, is there a thought to resurrect that information or recollect that um, to analyze exactly where um, there were deficiencies in, in the rates and, and, and to focus and prioritize? Because um, I, I echo Scott's and, and Chris's comment, you know, that there's, you know, all of this is intertwined, you know, the data collection template, you know, the definitions, the consistency in the data, um, it's a lot of work. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've um, tried different pieces of this, but um, at, the, at the end of the day, you know, it comes down to are the rates sufficient and, you know, reasonable, appropriate, attainable rates for the um, meaningful day services and how are we going to measure that at the end of the exercise? Sure. Yeah. So the fiat, um, I believe, uh, was really comparing uh, prior revenue to expected revenue and didn't necessarily take into account expenses. Um, but we you know, can certainly leverage any information that was uh, used in the past. Uh, I'll leave it up to Robert on whether or not there's any intent to um, do any more kind of fiat data collection or summaries. But I believe uh, in the past they had you know, left that tool open or the intent was to leave that tool open for providers to use on their own independently. Um, so uh, that's certainly something, you know, we can take a look back at and see what was in there. Um, if there's anything that can be pulled out of that that specifically kind of answers any of these questions or any data we can use to support that. Chris, it's Chris. Is there any information from the, the GL data collection tool pilot group that could be utilized as well? I mean, I don't know what data was submitted for review or if there was actually any, you know, we got to that point or we were just talking theory, but I mean, if there's something there, you've got some, you've got five providers, it's diverse group. Can we, can we look at it, eyeball it? Is there any value in, in what, uh, what was collected? I think that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure the level of data that are available. So, you know, if, if Hilltop can speak to that, that would be helpful. Um, but that's something we can take back and see uh, what we can use. Um, again, uh, just like you mentioned, you know, that's a provider group that's a sample of five. So that's something that, you know, we would definitely want to uh, contextualize and maybe not draw too many direct conclusions from, but it, it certainly could be informative if that's available. It'll let us know whether our GL collection tool is going to get what we need in the long run. If it's not there, it's not going to be there now or next year, year after. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so Chris, this is Kristen and Hilltop. Um, so I would agree we have a very small data set. Um, and as Karen, you know, had mentioned earlier, like her organization provided data you know in one way because they weren't able to to break things out so i think we've got a, a set of data that looks um a little different across all the providers um and probably would benefit you know from some additional guidance you know on collecting those cost data moving forward um, but i do agree with you like the goal um and the intent of the general ledger is to be able to collect the data that's needed um so we can certainly you know have further discussions um, with optimus about what we have that might be useful I just wanted to comment and say, um, I think that, you know, this all looks very promising. I think it'll be really helpful to see sort of the, the plan and the data and the different component approach to components, um, you know, as we move forward in, in writing and kind of have even more uh, a better sense of things. But, um, you know, I, I, I feel hopeful. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. This is Scott. I think Maria made an interesting point, meaning, or do we have a way to evaluate <laughs> at some point in the future whether this is sufficient? And I don't know. Chris, you went through your whole list of, um, of um, steps, and you may have said that, but I'm wondering, and, and that at some point down the road, is there is, is there going to be an evaluation process to say, "Golly, this is working or not?" You know, the GL data at some point will give us some information, but in, in, in any methodology, there should be some uh, some 
and the quality assurance I'm looking at it is didn't work. You know? So I, I thought it was an interesting point that Maureen made. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that's that's a great point. Um, so that's something that we will, uh, you know, make sure that we're kind of keeping on the horizon there of how that would be approached. Um, uh, like we mentioned, we had that fiat tool in the past, and that can be helpful. But again, if there's changes to expenses um, that may be different than changes to revenues, that can certainly have an impact uh, one way or the other. Um, so we're we are really looking for. Uh, any information and support and context uh, that can be provided from the RAG to try to uh, make sure that we're considering the things that uh, need to be appropriate there, um, as well as uh, you know utilizing the pilot group and as providers transitioning, getting kind of emerging information and being able to respond to that. Uh, but I think it's great great point, um, you know, like you're saying, Scott and Maria, that we need to do the best we can to evaluate um, how that is going to work out for providers. So um, I'll just uh, again say any additional thoughts around the process is welcomed um, you know, now or before the next meeting. And we're sharing that preliminary plan to give you an idea of the intended direction and ask for that feedback. So in the next meeting, uh, we'll have some of those proposed data requests that we can ex share a little more explicitly to get that RAG feedback um, before we begin requesting data from the provider community. And so at that time, any final comments from the RAG around the proposed process can be discussed. Um, and then, you know, with the understanding that this is a preliminary process in response to the direction that DDA has chosen for the fiscal year 25 cycle priorities, are there any other questions or feedback on that kind of preliminary direction um, or with the uh, proposed process there? Chris, it's Chris. I'll just say that I think we need to make an ongoing commitment to uh, you know, how we collect the data, our review, when we do collect the data, and being willing to uh, adjust as needed moving forward. I know that when we did the cost report many, many years ago, I don't think the form ever changed. And I think we're going to have to, to recognize that over time, things change in the industry, things change in the world that we live in, that that GL collection data tool, it's, it's not a set and done. It's going to be a process that we're going to have to manage uh, long term. And I've recommended before like a, a long term strategic you know data collection plan. And I still uh, we'll stand by that thought. I think that's some great uh, feedback. So um, I don't know if uh, DDA uh, wants to share any plans there at the moment, or if that's something they uh, need to discuss internally, um, but around uh, you know making sure that that data collection process is, kind of has some live or scheduled updates to make sure it stays relevant and consistent. Yeah, um, you know, I, I do agree and and I know we've had this conversation at the MAX conference, Chris, in some sort of uh, data strategy. And, and one of the other things, um, as I've been listening to the, the, the conversations around the general ledger data collection tool is um, I kind of think about <clears throat> um, my learnings from the days of the technical work group and um, when we at kind of that first round, um, out of that, Optimus was able to create sort of a, a rubric um, that kind of assist providers in realigning how they allocate costs. So I think we can, should probably dust that off and, and get feedback on that um, um, as we move more towards a, a standardized cost allocation methodology to in, inform um, the data going into that collection tool and ultimately um, decisions about rates.
So uh, again, really appreciate the input. I think you guys um, are are right on page with you know what we're planning to do here and all the the feedback that you've given us so far is really valuable and helpful and we'll make considerations in that uh, how we're moving forward any additional feedback or thoughts um, between now and the me next meeting would be really helpful uh, so that we can you know prevent present the most you know up-to-date relevant information at the next meeting um, and get that feedback on kind of those final versions of data collection tools uh, and how you know we plan to move forward there um, so, uh, yep, any, any other initial feedback or thoughts, please share that anytime, um, but we'll turn it back over to DBA. Um, I know there's a few things uh, left to walk through here. Hey, thank you, Chris. Um, uh, so we do have some remaining time for open discussion, um, roughly 30 minutes or so. Um, so, you know, before we walk through the next steps and conclude today's meeting, um, given our conversation and direction on the identified rate review priorities, uh, the department will take action through the RAG. And we'd like to start the open discussion with the topic of, of subgroups. Uh, so during this rate cycle, uh, the department will be directing state resources to the review of day HAB rates as part of our regular meeting process. Uh, however, as RAG members, you're welcome uh, to meet as part of uh, amongst yourselves between meetings to discuss issues of concern, conduct your own analyses, et cetera, and then any additional detail or context that comes out of those discussions uh, uh, should be brought back to the RAG for consideration, and, and then we will get those incorporated into the RAG meeting minutes. Hey Robert, this is Greg. I have a question. Sure. Um, in, when you when you began your presentation, um, you were talking uh, about uh, priority one, which was the development of uh, career ladders or career development, and you referenced a group that you were going to utilize for that. Can you elaborate? I, I'm not. I'm personally not familiar with that group, and I know in our organization we've been we've developed that process over the last five or six years. Um, so we'd love to be a part of that conversation. Um, was that something that you could elaborate a little bit on? Maybe I'm just out of the loop on that. Can you take that, Robert? Yes, thank you, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> so Greg, we, um, uh, in 2017, uh, Lori Sedleski, who's one of the listeners on here, and um, myself at SEEK, we wrote a grant for the, um, Depart to the Department of Labor to look at career pathways for DSPs. We had been an organization that had done DSP2 through NADSP, and at the time they didn't have the badging system, so it was incredibly cumbersome and we weren't able to move folks forward. Um, and Lori was um, instrumental in creating NADSP from the, ver from the ground up, and so had was very familiar with the processes around uh, building curriculum that was competency-based using the CMS competencies. So we applied for a Maryland Department of, Grape, uh, Maryland Department of Labor earned grant and received that. We formed a consortium that includes um, five providers, Donna, who's on this call, um, Jubilee, Seek, Arc of, uh, of Howard County, and um, Springdale, as I said, and Compass. And, um, Max is represented on the consortium as well as DDA and the Maryland Department of Labor. We created a DSP to career pathway um, as a part of a frame, a larger framework for the DSP1, DSP2, DSP3 framework that we had done separately for DDA using competency-based um, training pathways from based in, in research. Um, we have had 300 learners go through the process of so far from, and Scott is on this as well, Scott uh, has sent learners there. We've now increased the number of providers on the consortium to 12, or I think 10, including, um, so we're now in every region and working with folks. We did reach out, Greg, to your team because uh, as we build these competencies, we want to include not just the curriculum that will be available to everybody else um, because it's a 
uh, funded by the state curriculum, but people are who are using NADSP, we just need to line up the competencies. So using um, the NADSP badging system in addition to the um, homegrown uh, curriculum that will be available as we scale this across the state. Uh, we want to just make that. And so we've got, we've reached out to, to Joe and Joe knows that we're doing this uh, from there. And I think at the time Jennifer was going to be a part, we reached out to the folks that in your, your organization, there's another couple other organizations that are very embedded in the um, NADSP badging. We just need to make sure that your competencies and the competencies that DDA is asking for DSP twos to have is what the badges are that people are going after, that they're going after the ones that are consistent. Um, so that group has been working to develop curriculum. And by the way, we just got a earn grant um, to do frontline supervisor training as well. And we're looking at partnering with UMBC on creating and scaling a frontline supervisor training that is based on the NADSP uh, competencies. You, that's the, the format that we're using. And so, um, We've been collecting data and as a result of it being through the Department of Labor, they have access to social security numbers and data. And so when people sign up for the training, they have to have, uh, they have to give their social security number because it's a part of this grant. And so they are tracked through the Department of Labor. We have a return on, on investment of $17 invest or $1 invested by the state of Maryland has produced $17. Um, we have data that demonstrates that people who go through the, the through our DSP2 training, as I said, there's been 300 learners that have gone through, I think 270 or so that have uh, passed. We have external validation and um, reviews. So the people who do the curriculum and the people who review, that's the one thing that's really different with NADSP is the people who provide the curriculum and the people who certify are the same. And there's some interrelator reliability issues around that at the, at the, at the national level. So um, we're looking, we have external interrelator uh, inter uh, reviewers. So it's not the people who are teaching it are also reviewing. Um, so that's just a little bit about the work that's been done thus far by the Maryland, um, and I and I believe that they did present this year at the Max conference, and so Jessica um, and uh, a couple other folks the, of the other providers presented at the Max conference. But um, yeah, we would absolutely welcome. And um, if you have a point of uh, contact at your organization, Greg, um, I would love to have them be a part of the consortium to be a part of making sure that we're shaping the badging system to be consistent with what DDA wants those competencies to be on the career pathway. We're also working with the University of Minnesota Institute on Community Inclusion who wrote the content that's yep. used for both NADSP as well as our content. And uh, we're looking forward to, to having them come into the state and do more work around the um, DSP1 as well as DSP2. So thank you for that. Uh, that uh, that helps me a lot to understand because I've heard bits and pieces, but I haven't really understood the entire process there. And, and I think that as we look at how um, we want to get to more of a value based uh, system in terms of, of, of compensation, um, we have we have a lot of data over five or six years of um, we, we uh, our retention rate for people that have been certified. Um, and we have, we have, I think, I was looking at the data the other day, I think we have 54 DSP-3s now in our organization. We have, uh, for people that have been in the program, uh, the, uh, the retention rate is about 86%, compared to those that are not in any type of certification program, which is gonna be somewhere in the 50 to 60%. So when we're looking at how we actually tie that into a, a, you know, a, a system that values that, those uh, th those metrics are really really important to understand yeah. because you know we and, and we all know this but the world that we live in the amount of money that is being spent on turnover and vacancy and overtime and and all of those type of things really if we can get a clear and consistent understanding of just what that looks like that could drive some of these um, you know the these these uh, these professionals that work with us to a true 
you know, working and living wage because you're paying for it one, one way or the other in your system. And, um, and, you know, not to, not to chase another rabbit, but just a conversation with the team yesterday about the amount of compliance required, the amount of compliance necessary above a truly skilled DSP, you know, is what sucks so much of the cost out of the system to be able to properly compensate people for the work that they do. So um, I applaud what you guys are doing. I just, you know, if we can, if we can be of benefit with our learning and participate as well, I think that we, we would have to be careful with a one size fits all system. Um, because I know that there are folks that are, uh, uh, there are other providers that are heavily investing right now in the eBadge program with NADSP. And I think there's other certifications out there as well that some, some may be utilized, but um, getting consistency around what those outcomes are and making sure that they align with the CMS competencies is, uh, is really important as well. So thank you for that. Yeah, no, we absolutely. So if you want to send me a contact, I'd really appreciate that. We, we, we kind of missed each other passing, uh, passing back and forth, uh, yeah. reaching out to, to your team and, and others. And we have invited others on who do the NA, who are embedded in the NADSP badging. I think the only really important thing here is that we are aligning the bad, the competencies. So if DDA says we want people to have these skills to be called a DSP2 in the state of Maryland and to get funded, then those are the e badges people have to take. So, right. um, and, and the DSP3, the proposal that we did for DSP3 was um, national certification. So there's, na you know, there's RBT, there's CESP, there's, um, there's a person-centered planning. So there's a number of national organizations outside of the DSP arena um, to professionalize DSPs that they do have the skills, qualifications, and competencies and, and we've used that and your, your data sounds great. We, our data, the last time that the Beacon Institute, which is out at, at Salisbury University was, did our, did our data crunch, what they found was that uh, the DSP2s, um, each of the organization was measured separately and the highest turnover was a D, in DSP2 was 7% or retention rate of, uh, 93%, and there was one organization that had a 0% turnover in two years for everybody trained in DSP2s. And I think part of the dialogue, I, uh, going back to what Chris, uh, what Chris was saying earlier about the, the whole scale is, what we're finding, especially with uh, folks that are in low technology areas, is the, the level of, of technology that needs to be brought into the building of the infrastructure of the organization is absolutely critical for these DSP2 um, training and learning. And so it's not just let's raise the salaries, it's not just let's add training on, but there's infrastructure, as you said, there's infrastructure dollars that need to be added um, to, support, uh, to support that. And we're collecting that data at this time. We were, pre we were pretty close to having some data, but you know, working with DDA on that. So love to have more people participate as, as we scale this. This is not gonna be easy. Um, and it's a change of culture, as you know, in your organization, it's a yeah. tremendous change in culture about how people think and support and respect their DSP workforce. No, no question. The, and the, the other thing that we found is that you have to have your, you have to have team members on the ground supporting your DSPs yeah. through that process as well. And so, um, you know, as we as as we envision, you know, the future twenty years down the road, wouldn't it wouldn't it be awesome if everybody that enters this field enters with an expectation that they're going to perform at a certain level? You know, that that that's where you know when you and I are long gone sipping whatever on the beach, you know, <laughs> we want our we want the legacy of our organizations to be heading in that trajectory. And, you know, um, not having the 30 or 40 year conversation about the workforce crisis and how people are so massively underpaid in this field. So, yeah, I think there's I think there's the, the potential for a win there. Um, but I do think it's going to require some very intentional work and to be able to 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 use provable data about raising how we raise the standard of our of our team members. And, and, and the respect around that, how that then equates into maybe how some, like, like my vision is, has always been that you, 
you're able to take some levels of your organization out if you have really great people on the ground doing the job that is closest aligned to the mission. And Absolutely. So, <clears throat> yeah, and we did do calculations about what turnover cost us, and uh, you know, it's it's somewhere around seven thousand dollars. So we took five thousand of that and reinvested it in the organization into those DSPs through wages, technology, and those types of things, uh, benefits. And as a result, um, had a significantly lower turnover rate, somewhere around 14 to 17% on an annual basis, as a result of investing that turnover dollars back in. So we have some data on that. So we certainly have the data to support DBA's uh, decisions around this and um, you know, need that infrastructure built with the policies uh, going forward to be able to scale this statewide. Great. Thank you, Karen. Hey, oh, Robert, it's Chris. I was just going to say that they both just confirmed for me that everything is intertwined together. <laughs> I, I mean, it really just, we're having that conversation. I'm listening. I'm like, yep, yep. I mean, it's hard to separate all the, the pieces to the puzzle. Uh, Robert, I, I didn't want to, I mean, to cut you off. I did have something of a follow up to, to the uh, subgroup component, but I'll let you go, please. Thank you. Sure. I was, um, thank you, Karen, Greg, and, and, you know, all of you for your thoughtful comments thus far and um, Chris this is probably a, a good segue to, to walk on items. Uh, I was just we could actually just chat about the subgroups I, I think we reached out to the the RI committee members and got some feedback or at least to look for some feedback a potential subgroup setup I was hoping that maybe you could share some of that information and then I was hoping you might be able to clarify too you made a comment a few minutes ago about uh, the ability now to meet amongst ourselves and I just want to clarify that that comment the rules to that situation because I think originally that was a conflict to the original bylaw set up or at least the original direction we had received and just want to make sure we're in compliance sure and Jennifer I mean need to, to lean on you but I think as long as there's not a quorum uh, there they can certainly meet offline is that correct yeah that's right and then um if folks did want to meet to look at a specific issue we would then provide space within our reg meetings um or report out on that Robert, clarify for me. Did you mention that if we did meet outside, that we would need to come back and report to the main RA group? Yes, you would want to bring that back uh, to RA to get it incorporated back into that process, um, as well as to get it into the meeting minutes uh, for approval. Okay. I, 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 go Chris, ahead, Laura. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, I'm not sure if I heard completely correctly. If um, Jennifer, did you say that if there is a if there are seven? Because I'm looking at the charter. If there are seven or more group members, that then the group would need to report back, or would it be any? I mean, you you, you wouldn't want to have it be any communication because that would I mean really limit any discussion at all. Right. So I think what, what we're saying is that the department is putting its resources behind monthly RAG meetings. Um, we are not able to staff subgroups at this time, but if subset, if a subset of the RAG have specific things that among themselves they want to look into, um, speak about, we would provide Space in the RRAG agenda um, or report out on that and discussion. Okay, and does it so? Let me. And does it matter how many people are? You know, if a group wanted to get together and talk about, you know, data collection for DAHAB or no, data collection might be a bad example, but some aspect of DAHAB. Um, how many people are part of that group?
we'll we'll have to take that back and um, get additional direction. Okay, thank you. We want to just do that right now. Do we want to just throw out? We've got a couple priorities. Do we want to just throw out a couple priorities and have people? I mean, it's if if we're going to have subgroups, I think it's better to organize them here than to have multiple subgroups on different topics all around. Well, I'll just say, I think, um, I mean, we're certainly interested in, in both priorities, workforce and meaningful day. Um, I, I feel like I wanna probably get a better sense of kind of this, you know, after this initial discussion, Chris Welch talked about um, kind of taking this and putting together maybe a little more of a plan. And I feel like once I see that, I would have a better sense of kind of like, okay, what does it make sense to meet and talk about offline to bring it back and make, you know, these meetings as uh, substantive as possible? Well, I would go back to the, to the Department of Health staff here and say, what would you expect or welcome from a subgroup? And what is the timing that you would want that? So it sounds to me like most of the demand around subgroups has been for work to continue in between these monthly meetings. I mean, and our intent is that um, the way we're taking a measured approach to our, our tasks this year through sampling and kind of building it out in steps will kind of help that work continue between meetings. But if there's areas where subgroups could, can, could help speed things along in between meetings that, that sounds to me like where where the need was articulated but i think that goes back to your earlier point Laura. um i think one helpful thing that would kind of get all of our heads around this is um kind of sending out a written version of the the items that were discussed today and then having that next level of detail I think that, that will help us have a more um, concrete idea um and i mean really i think the work from today using this initial feedback between um between now and the next meeting will also help to shape that potential collaboration but basically and what we, what we were all just saying that kind of having that that plan we might start to see where that additional work in between meetings would be most helpful jennifer are you or robert Bye. able to share again we did a survey about subgroups and and i think uh, each of the members responded are you able to share that feedback that you received collectively as a whole Um, I will go back and we can we can talk about that internally. My my interpretation of that message on subgroups would allow us some flexibility, <laughs> and and I may be I may be in a minority, but I, I think that if we have flexibility to get together and and you know create some ad hoc sort of work groups i, I, I kind of like to have that flexibility which is sort of my interpretation of the intent as opposed to trying to tie it down too much I don't want to trip over ourselves yeah i, I, I think like that, that is is the i think that is the intent 
think you're correct. But what we can do between now and the next meeting is, like I said, have a, a written version of what was discussed today. Um, and we can go back and uh, double check what specific um, guardrails we would be required to put on the outside discussion with the overall intent of trying to add this, this flexibility to look at um, issues between meetings. So while we won't be facilitating formal subgroups, um, we can provide some additional guidance around that offline collaboration and feedback. Definitely I'm hearing that need from all of you and agree with it. Um, I don't know if we're, if we're done with this topic. I wanted to just um, make one other um, uh, suggestion around a, uh, under the walk-on item part of the agenda. Sure, that would be okay, uh, Laura. We're... <clears throat> Thanks, Robert. Um, I um, I think it might be helpful um, if, as part of the agenda, if we could maybe in the minutes and then related um, in the agenda have um, kind of the uh, actionable items that everybody's responsible for that come out of a meeting um, maybe you know summarized at the end of um, the minutes for each meeting and then have some place on the agenda the next month for a, an update on those items. Okay, I'm, I'm just making a note. Thank yep. you for that. Any other walk on items? Robert, it's Chris. Actually, just to, to follow up to, uh, to Laura's point, and, and I've actually got a couple notes here. We had a couple items from the last time uh, that uh, we've not discussed today. Uh, in the open discussion in the last meeting, uh, we had discussed the transportation adjustment moving forward. Uh, and it said this can be looked at in detail in the next meeting. And uh, to Laura's point, it's it's not a, a item on our agenda. Uh, and then there was an additional one of uh, following up uh, with the department uh, for the $20 million in the governor's budget for LTSS pertaining to transportation and meaningful data. I think we've kind of got an answer that, you know, we've got that commitment and direction to fixing day rates on that piece of it. But they tend to sometimes get lost. Uh, and I think that having that that item to be able to move forward and follow up on is important. And I didn't know if Chris, if, if you might be able to to offer any update on the uh, the transportation adjust, adjustment and uh, you know how it's moving forward. So Chris, uh, I I think you're referring to the adjustment that was made to the transportation component uh, during the last cycle based on the data that was collected. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the, well, yep, I'm looking at the minutes from last time, and it says uh, Mr. Welch offered that the transportation adjustment is moving forward, and this can be looked at in detail in the next meeting. And I don't recall exactly the, the context of that conversation, uh, but you know, again, we've got something in the minutes that says let's get an update. And to Laura's point, it doesn't make it to the next meeting, so I think there's definitely value in having that that flow. It could okay. be one of the it could be the agenda item or two where, where we address potentially subgroups where we say, hey, we're going to get together outside of this officially uh, as a subgroup on this particular item, make you aware at that point in time. And then there's a follow up agenda item for the next meeting to so come back and report or whatever the case may be. Sure, we'll go back and look at that. I, I you know, we look at so many documents and. And, and things related to this process, but I thought we sent, and I could be wrong, but I thought we sent out kind of a matrix to show um, the impact that that adjustment had on specific services. And as you know, we can't really, uh, the, the budget is still going through that approval process. 
Um, but once that has been completed and we can make the actual adjustments within the, the brick, uh, we can certainly show how that impacts the rate. But I think for some services, um, it's as much as a 40% increase, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Chris, is that correct? Yeah, I think what we had um, looked at last year was a there was a 33% increase to employment services, 41% uh, increase to CDS, and a 37% increase to DAHAB um, with regard to the uh, transportation component, which um, off the top of my head, and yeah, I, I thought there was um, a matrix that was out there, but off the top of my head, I believe was about an 8% increase to those rates. Um, just as the transportation uh, component, not uh, including any sort of um, uh, COLA cost of living adjustment. I remember some discussion. I don't. I don't remember seeing a matrix. Um, uh, maybe others do, but I don't remember seeing that. So you know, if that is, if that does exist, it would probably be helpful for this group. Are you talking about when you gave us the current status on that particular um, priority? Is that what you're talking? Is that what you're talking about? The matrix? You gave us a status of, of transportation component equity. You did give us a status on that. Is that is that what you're referencing? Or is it something different? Yeah, what we'll do is because there, there is a matrix, we'll just ensure that we attach it uh, to the uh, minutes uh, that, that go out for this meeting so that you all have it and um, put it under um, on, on the agenda for, for next month as follow up and so that we can, you know, review it again. Any other walk on items before I turn it over to Jennifer? Okay, well, uh, once again, I want to thank you all um, on, on behalf of the department for your flexibility, uh, especially in giving us additional time to, you know, just do more um, analyses, et cetera. Um, you, know, you know, obviously, we know that all of your time is, is very valuable and um, that you're taking time out to help uh, inform this very important process. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jennifer, to close this out. All right. Um, so I thank, thank you all for, for the discussion today. Um, I know I always find your feedback very helpful as we continue on in this process. Um, I think we've been taking notes on all of the, the materials that we need to be sure to uh, send out before the next meeting um, so that everyone is prepared. Um, we look forward to our next meeting on Thursday, March 16th at 10 a.m. Um, members of the public who would like to observe the meetings can register through the DBA training calendar at Constant Contact Events. Um, register once and get reminders for each meeting via GoToMeeting. Um, meeting connection links will be sent one day and one hour prior to the meeting. Um, meeting minutes will be made available following the meeting. Um, if you have any questions regarding uh, registration or would like to request accommodations, um, please contact Dr. Smalls. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so yeah, this slide shows our upcoming meeting date. Um, and please note the time change starting in April. And can we go to the next slide? Um, all meeting materials will be made available through the designated DDA webpage for the advisory group. And let's go to the next slide. Um, so thank you again for attending and um, your participation. 
and we look forward to continuing our discussion on March 16th. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.